Backyard Green Films is proud to present this episode of Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Alara and her husband, Rick, travel throughout the land in their teardrop trailer that they have nicknamed Maggie, bringing you stories about their travels and the people they meet. They visit farmers, ranchers, and just about anyone who loves putting their hands in the dirt or their feet in stirrups. For the past three years, they have been filming a documentary about heritage breed animals entitled The Holstein Dilemma, Heritage Breeds, and the Need for Biodiversity. In those travels, they have gotten to meet some very interesting people. Here's one of those interviews. Hi, this is Alara, and welcome back to our podcast. This week, we're bringing you an interview with Francisco Javier Navas Gonzalez, DVM, professor in the Department of Genetics at the University of Cordoba in Spain. And if that name in the DVM part didn't sound impressive enough, he has his PhD in quantitative genetics, behavioral genetics, and biostatistics. I know, big lofty sounding deal, right? But he's absolutely one of the most down-to-earth guys ever. And when he hits a topic he's really excited about, he gets bubbly and enthusiastic. It's kind of hard not to get bubbly and enthusiastic with him whenever he's talking about it at the moment. And we're talking about quantitative genetics, so that's really saying something about his ability to move people. We met him at the 2019 Donkey Welfare Symposium at UC Davis. He was one of the speakers there, and he gave a presentation entitled, The Origin of Donkey Breeds. Basically, his talk was on how we found our asses in the wild. Had to say it. But then domesticated them and moved them around the globe. No, that never gets old. He's posted that one on researchgate.net, so if you look him up, you can download the presentation. You can also see some of the pictures he showed us, including the Pega donkey. That's one of the most majestic animals I've seen. And yes, donkeys can be majestic. Who'd have thunk? Now, the origin of donkey breeds sounds like it could have been a nice little lecture, somewhat informative, but a little boring. I will correct you now if you had that impression. The room at the symposium was packed, and it was a pretty big room. Javier speaks English with one of those wildly impressive Spanish accents, as you'll hear. Kind of like the most interesting man in the world meets Antonio Banderas, so please read the phone book for me and I'll feel like I'm in a cafe in Barcelona with cool wind in my hair. That kind of thing. He's wearing a Batman t-shirt in his picture on researchgate.net, so you know he's kind of a cool dude. I have to admit it was hard to grab him for an interview because he had four or five people around him at any given time at the symposium waiting to get a word in. And he spent time talking earnestly and enthusiastically to everybody. I will only use the phrase donkey groupies once, I think. So this guy is kind of like Indiana Jones. If you've seen the movie, you know that technically Indiana is a professor of archaeology. But that doesn't really cover it, because often when you try to understand or find one thing, you end up studying a whole bunch of other things that impacted it along the way. History, culture, religion, art, science, and pretty much exposure to about 57 other topics. Finding things is hard to do, and when your topic has a long history or moved around a lot over time, it gets harder yet. So how do you go about a research project like this? I assume that there would be things like genetic testing and lots and lots of reading. But the donkey's been around a long time and they're all over the place. To make it harder, they've moved around the globe a lot because of the movement of people. But Javier also uses pictorial history and examples in art and architecture. Mayan carvings, illuminated manuscripts, Egyptian tomb paintings, a skeleton from a Jordanian archeological dig, and the list goes on and on and on. This is how he does his research. Sound like Indiana Jones yet? So I have to say that I learned quite a bit when I started researching the Holstein Dilemma documentary. But one of the most interesting things to me was the importance of Spain throughout our history in the United States. The Spanish brought to this continent pretty much the bulk of our agricultural stock in the U.S. They brought horses and cattle to Florida in the 1500s and the animal species just kept coming in waves for the next few hundred years. Pigs, goats, chickens, you name it, the Spaniards brought them over. 
and they adapted and migrated across the country over time to become things that we consider to be uniquely American. Longhorn cattle originated from a Spanish breed. Mustang horse, Spanish breed again, and on and on. The mammoth jack is one of the most interesting combinations of animals we have here in America. It was an animal that was created by George Washington, among other people, and it's a combination of many different kinds of donkeys, including the Andalusian and the Majorcan and the Catalan. I found it terribly fitting to have the Spanish version of Indiana Jones here at the Donkey Welfare Symposium. He was kind enough to break away from the donkey groupies to talk to us for a few minutes about what he does and why he does it. Okay, I had to use it one more time. We're hoping to make it to Spain next year to talk to Javier again about the origins of many of our breeds here in the U.S. and see what they look like in their country of origin. But until then, here is the very nice, very intelligent, and very gracious Indiana Jones. Oops, I mean Dr. Francisco Javier Navas Gonzalez. Well, actually, I, I'm, my name is Francisco Javier Navas Gonzalez. I'm a PhD uh, from uh, the University of Córdoba in Quantitative Behavioral Genetics and Statistics. And uh, my, my former degree is I'm a veterinarian. To save an animal, you need to eat it. Yes. It's actually my professor said that at a press round in Spain, it was published in local newspaper and national newspaper. And the truth is that you get straight to the point. It's just forget about all the stuff about the, you know, um, also, if things are done properly, I mean, if things aren't done properly, you're going to have welfare concerns and all that stuff. But think for a time that we are humans and the, that we are able to think of the way to do it. But it's, it's even past to save an animal, you have to eat it. It's the animal must have a purpose, yeah, regardless of true. what the purpose is. What, whatever it is. But I mean... Consider how consider the numbers. I mean, how many millions of people are we? How many millions of people you need to feed? And then you have sports, okay, but still, how much animal, how many animals do you need to, to, to practice sports? For assisted therapy, it would be okay with don't know, 27, 30 donkeys for the hospital. We have 44 millions. Okay, we have Maybe we cover all the needs for all the assisted therapy hospitals in the world. We will cover up to, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000, what happens with the rest of millions of donkeys. So, you know, we need, we need to find any purpose is good. Okay, so purpose by, by breed because there are characteristics, because I've often heard people say, you know, a, a, a mix of genetics is a healthier animal in general. What would you say to that argument? Depends on the context. Actually, sometimes uh, the good thing about local breeds is that they are more adapted to the place that they are in, both from a um, disease resistance perspective, both because they are adapted to the weather. Uh, so, you know, with genetics, you need to work with that. Uh, sometimes you get an improvement out of crossing animals, which is called the effect of heterosis. You know, you get... Hybrid vigor, yeah, correct? Yeah, yeah, hybrid vigor. So you got the animals crossing, you got the best and the best from those animals in the first filial generation. Then everything stops. Because it stops because, I mean, if you, if you continue crossing these animals, you may get the best or the, or the worst. You know. So, so it depends. And, and now that's a really important point because I got into discussion last night about the about the benefits of keeping the ingredients separate. So if we need to add them again, they can come back in. But I, you know, we, we talked to a pig farmer and he said that the first generation of the cross between the two pure, pure breeds does exactly what I want it to do. Yeah. And after that, if you cross, if you, if you continue those lines and let them breed, you lose the benefit. Yes, why, why is that genetically? Because, I mean, characters appear. So if you cross, you know, the good thing is that you're crossing one animal which has a good characteristic with another animal and you, need to, you want to make like the most of, out of them. But if you get the same animals which have been crossed, I mean the same, the same you know, brothers and sisters, let's say, and you cross them, 
either they are not brothers and sisters, like strictly related, but they have the same genetic background, you have a 50% genetic material which is going to be assigned at random. Who's telling us that this 50% it's all good? You cannot say. I mean, even with humans it happens. You don't know which is the inheritance that you're going to get from your mother or your father. You know we have cancer, which is inherited. We, we have many illnesses that are inherited, and it happens exactly like that. So that's what we call in genetics a terminal cross. You get one breed, another breed, you cross them, and then this cross is destined to a slaughterhouse. You do not use that. Now, some people might say that we are advancing enough in genetics to where we can, we can take the bad out eventually and just keep the good. What would you say to that? I would say that we don't know anything. We don't know anything. I mean, every single day we find out new things, new things that, I did, that we didn't know, new things that we thought we knew and that are not working the way we used to think. And it just, you know, it's all about science and the way science works. We all need to work, and we all need what we think to be proven right. So we condition that. There are ways to condition that. So there are ways to condition science. Still, I mean, somehow we may be playing to be God. And nature is unpredictable. Genetics, when we speak about genetics, we speak about probabilities. And if you don't have that in mind, you're losing like, like very many of the information. I mean, you can try to handle things, but then nature is going to follow its way. We have, for example, let's, let's give you an example. Uh, imagine that you clone an animal. That, that is, you have an exact copy of the animal that you want, because, for example, it's the best at raising, the best at, I don't know, milk, uh, production, meat production. And you expect this animal because you're copying it completely to get the same results as the animal that you took the information from. It doesn't happen. And that's an interesting thing. We, we uh, got to see the Irish drafts and there, there was a very, very, or Irish sports, which comes from an Irish draft horse and they use it in Ireland. Well, they had a horse named Cruising that, that hit all of the events back there. They was such a phenomenal jumper. He won all the prizes. So they cloned him and they found that the clones had many characteristics of the, uh, what do you call it, parent of the yeah. original and yet not exact. Yeah, because environment plays part. I mean, it's mathematics. Gene uh, I mean, uh, the phenotype of an animal, and when I, see, when I say phenotype, I'm saying color, ability to run, ability to produce meat, is the sum of genetics plus environment. Physical characteristics. Yes. So, as long as you have an individual, there is something that is called in genetics a uh, permanent environmental effect, which depends in the, on, on the inner characteristic of each individual just because they are different individuals, even if they have been copied. For example, think of the case of twins. Twins are similar, but the experiences that they have in life, how they are trained, how they think, is different. And they, if they are, you know, monozygotic twins, they should be replicates but still there's variability. And that happens because, you know, biology is not one plus one is two. Okay, so now tie this into heritage breeds, land race animals, the, the what, four, four breeds of donkeys that you said started yeah. initially, and tell me how the environment shapes how the animal grows in the future. Okay, so Im imagine, let's, let's go back to the beginning. For example, they, they, you, you have um, uh, uh, an animal that is sharing a pattern at a place. And you say, okay, these animals are good, but I would like them to produce more milk. Then I start selecting. Start first, I mean, in the ancient time, they didn't know about numbers. But they knew 
that if they have one highly producing animal and they cross it to a highly producing animal, then the result was a higher producing animal. Um, what happens here is that this can be done when you have very large sample of animals and then the effects of variability are not covered. What, what, what does this mean? I mean, if you have a large sample of animals, you can have like a picture of the real variability in the population. So visually, you're able to decide which animals are be better and which are worse. But we are not in this point. We are in the point that we have already selected animals. So we have made things more complicated. Thrown away. Yeah, yes. there's no possible, it's not possibility, it's not a possibility to make a visual selection of characteristics. So we need to quantify these characteristics. Now, you gave a slide that I thought was very interesting in your presentation. It was the green background where you talked about the stud book. And you talked about characteristics that carry through, whether that be the ability to amble versus walk, the yeah. ability to uh, uh, color patterns and things of that nature. So these are above the norm or below the norm, correct? Uh, uh, explain that in terms of this conversation, because those characteristics are very specific and very, very much quantified by a number. Well, actually, it depends on the, it depends on the breed. I mean, when I speak about a pattern, we speak about um, three kinds of patterns. Well, maybe three and a four that we should uh, be aware of. The first thing is a phenotypic, uh, like morphological, symmetrical, phaneroptical, which is color, horns, uh, you know, a pattern that we must be aware of. We need to have a population of animals that is similar to each other somehow. Then we have a genetical pattern. There needs to be a genetic background supporting that symmetry that, you know, you can have animals that can be similar, but still genetically different. And when I say genetically different, it's not the kind of variation that you expect to be a within breed variation, but an interbreed variation, I mean wide variation. Then you have the functional pattern. Normally, functional patterns are directly related to zoometry. And this is a, like a reversible way. It means, um, what I normally say is I give the example of the giraffe. Does the giraffe have a long neck to eat the leaves on the top of the, of the tree? Or she eats the leaves on the top of the tree because he has a long neck? We need to think of that. So, you know, maybe some animals have some qualities and then we use them for a certain purpose. Maybe we want to use those animals for a certain purpose and then we push the patterns, the morphological patterns, the phenotypical patterns to that direction. And then the fourth pattern that we must consider to uh, work with breeds is the socio-cultural pattern. We provide breeds with their entity because, we, I mean, without humans, the concept of breeds doesn't exist. We created it. And the truth is that we shouldn't think of breeds as a static thing because our needs are changing, are constantly changing. So what we need is the breed to adapt the situation. Now that is a huge argument that you just talked about there because there is one camp that's firmly in the position of we must preserve this like it's in a museum. And there's another camp that says the purpose is to adapt and survive, otherwise it's just a museum piece. Yeah. It's not a practical thing. Do you see both sides of that argument or is there validity to one or the other or neither? No, the only thing is that people focus, I think po people is focusing or is approaching the, the, uh, the, the issue in a bad way. I mean, when people tries to solve that variability issue, what they do is to cross with other breeds. And we mustn't do that. I mean, if you want to do that and you have one breed in any part of the world that can do that, why don't we go for it? Why, why not just have mutts that are stronger in general? Yeah, but I mean, I mean, 
you know, what is stronger here may not be stronger in the other side of the Atlantic. So in your giraffe example, we either have a giraffe that can eat leaves because it has a longer neck or grew a longer neck because it wanted to eat the leaves. But if we have taller trees in the future, we must have the ability to get a longer neck giraffe or all giraffes will maybe, not survive. You know, maybe natural selection is going to play his part. Natural selection because uh, if these animals are not able to reach the leaves and we are not able to, like, to give them the leaves that they cannot reach, these animals are not, are, are not going to be are profitable and they are going to start like diminishing in numbers and numbers and numbers and they're going to, I mean, they're, they're going to disappear if we don't find them a profitable uh, purpose. So would you say, would you say that this allows elasticity within the system yes. to have different genetics available? Yes. Actually, we, I mean, genetics is it's out of variability. What we do with genetics and genetic diversity diversity, it means also intra-breed uh, diversity. I mean, breeds not, I mean, have you seen uh, dogs evolution? Bulldog. Try to find out a picture of a bulldog from the ancient times, not the ancient, but I mean, I mean, from, from you know, the uh, 90s, at the beginning of the 90s, and compared to the current bulldog that we have. They seem to be different breeds, but still are the same. What do you think in the case of bulldog? Would it good or bad? I think that somebody had a purpose for that. It's not my purpose, yeah. but I think that definitely it, I would not necessarily have gone quite so extreme in that direction. Yeah, but, but I also know that you can get bulldogs here or a boxer, we have a neighbor that has a boxer and he got it in Puerto Rico and it's a little bit of a different looking boxer than the one here. So if I wanted to go closer to that kind of a boxer, I could go to Puerto Rico and maybe find a breeder that did it. Or here, the same thing. There is variability within the specific breed, correct? So you, you can do that. Yes. The only thing that's, I mean, we need to try harder. It's just not, I mean, crossing to get a better thing is the easy thing because we know it works. But still, it may not work at all cases. So this is why we chose the Holstein Dilemma as a title for our documentary. Because the animal, the Holstein, produced. We selected heavily for production. And yet selected so heavily that the entire gene pool is, not the entire, but almost is two bulls and 92 or 100 cows. Yeah. And so within that breed, there is an extremely narrow selection and an extremely narrow genetic pool, one breed. Yeah. But they can somewhat repair that by bringing in other breeds, correct? No. Well, the word, rep I wouldn't say the word repair because if reparation involves uh, disturbing, you mean, I mean, uh, like, like making some bad things towards what we already have, this is not reparating. This, okay, this is like that. a short term. I mean, short term fix. Yeah. Okay, but why? In the long term, we're losing t the both breeds. Because you've diluted it. So yeah. you have a longhorn that's not really a longhorn, long, it's now it's a, it's a Watusi or a Brahma. Call, call it different. Yeah. Maybe with time it becomes a breed. See, now that's what I, what I don't understand about the argument that says don't touch it. You, you can still maintain breed A over here and breed B over here, but make a new one and have breed C as well, as long it as you keep all of them. Depends on the context. Maybe they don't do well. I mean, it depends. Uh, some of these crossbred breeds do not well at all conditions. Yes. You know, some of these highly uh, uh, selected breeds are not working well if you take him, for example, to the desert of Sahara, you may have a really selected breed to like to produce, like like the the uh, like the highest amount of milk here in the United States, and then you take that cow to the desert, and it's the the worst one. But that is adapted to that locality, and so therefore it might make it in the United States, but it would not make it in the desert of the Sahara, correct? Yeah. Yeah. So it becomes a regional adaptation. Uh, it depends. I mean, um, we, we have 
uh, like settle a, a very like extreme uh, example. But even here in the United States, if we have uh, different locations, we have natural disasters and we have natural conditions, humidity, uh, temperature, and we have um, many uh, uh, different conditions to which local breeds may be adapted and to which some of the breeds are not. If we select, we are narrowing this spectrum. That's what we have to, to think of. I mean, we, need, we, we narrow the, the ability that these animals have to survive. It's not about color. It's not about functionality, it's about their ability to survive. Because we are making them comfortable and we are giving them, you know, the perfect background, genetic background for the perfect environment and we are controlling it. But I mean, as I said, this is not one plus one is equals uh, two. Things change. And what happens if, you know, we, know we, we have global warming. Things are changing and we need to see how these breeds are going to adapt to this current changing situation. So it sounds to me like you're saying we need options. We, we, actually, we have option, options, and these options are provided by the different breeds that we have in the world. So we need to preserve the options. We need to preserve the options, yes. actually. Yes. Now, one of the things that uh, the good Dr. Eric is, uh, asked me to ask you, he says, how does the body respond to insults? from a genetic perspective, which kind of feeds into what you're talking about. So uh, relating to genetics, are there some breeds that are more pest resistant or more, uh, they have a, a stronger ability to fight off certain diseases than others genetically? Of course, of course. Now you say of course, but does the lay person understand the difference? Um, I mean, sometimes we don't even understand the difference because you know, we haven't focused on disease resistance. The study of the analysis of genetic background for disease resistant and, uh, you know, for example, in cattle for mammitis and for all the stuff, is not that, that, that old. I mean, it's only been like, I like, uh, don't know, it started maybe in the, in the late 80s or so. Starting about thinking of that. So it's not that far. So how can we transmit that information to the people when we still doesn't even control it on the whole. Still, uh, for example, in my case, one of the things that, I'm, that I've included in the selection program of the Andalusian donkey breed is the selection for their resistance to summer source, which is an illness. That's a very specific thing. Yeah, but still there's a problem, you know, what we did to select, it, it, when, when, you, when you see the stew book of the Andalusian in which you see the, the catalog on the Andalusian, you think that these have all, all things have been thought by researchers and they decided what was best. No, they come out of meetings with the owners and we ask them, what is your concern? So you can have an Andalusian and you are selecting for that one specific resistance, but somebody with an Andalusian in a different region in the country might select for something separate? Yeah, sure. It depends on what you want. And it's still an Andalusian, though. And still an Andalusian, of course, because there's variability. I mean, variability means you can have an animal which is totally resistant to an animal which is not resistant at all. So what it, what, what it is the moment? Where is the moment where the Andalusian in the East and the West, selected for two different things, becomes a different breed altogether? Well, it need, you need time. Yes. You need, I mean, you need much, much many things than uh, resistant to an illness to become a breed. As I said, social cultural background, phenotypic background, genetic background. I mean, just because a breed has a different reproductive pattern, it doesn't make it a different breed. So use the Mammoth Jack, for example, yeah. the United States breed. Uh, that came about part by George Washington, I believe, yeah. uh, with a that was the start, four different four different animals, correct? And a little Andalusian, a little bit of uh... well, actually, we shouldn't. I mean, though we should consider that the start of something, we shouldn't consider that the start of the the mammoth uh, donkey. Why? Because the purpose of George Washington was to produce mules. It wasn't to produce donkeys. 
but still it, it, it comes in the way. So, mammoth donkeys came a little bit later. This is the, the donkeys that were originally sent from Spain, most of them perished in the sea. I mean, we only had two animals finally arriving to the United States. But then afterwards, when the media and the transport were better, much many more animals came here. So that's how you have all the variability that you have in the United States, uh, the, the American mammoth donkey. Otherwise, where does the sorrel come from? Where does the brown come from? Where does the, you know, you have all sorts of sizes and colors here. So we need to understand this progress as a constant progress. Furthermore, you have the thing that mammoth donkey hasn't been selected according to a standard, just a height standard. You know, you want it to be as tall as it can be. Just physical characteristics for the purpose of Meal production. Meal production. production. But that is a purpose as well. So it really doesn't matter if a horse is used or if two colors are used. If you have white and red to produce pink. We need to see. The red is still valid. The white is still valid, but it's still pink. So yeah. it still has a purpose and you still want white and red. Yeah, but still we need to see whether these animals are sufficiently genetically different, sufficiently uh, phenotypically different, and if the people use this for a sufficient different purpose. And whether, as a fourth, you know, you always can see that the four, the four dimensions that I told you about, phenotypic, morphological, uh, genetical, uh, uh, functional, and then the sociocultural acceptance of that breed. I mean, if you cross whatever you want to cross, whatever the purpose it is, however similar it is genetics, but people doesn't buy it, you don't have a breed. Okay, now that touches again on something that we discussed before we turned the cameras on, and that was, I asked you if this is the only Worldwide Donkey Symposium you, you uh, attend, and you listed the other ones, which you can list again, that'd be great. And then you said that they all have different purposes. Could you explain a little bit about that and why a perspective of here might be very different from a Donkey Symposium in China, it might be different from somewhere in Ethiopia? Okay, so um, the first, the first uh, Donkey World Conference that was held was held in the island of Idra by, uh, uh, by the, uh, insti uh, I think it's the Institute of African Studies, by the Professor Ed Emery. Uh, this conference was mainly based on global purposes. And when I say global pur purposes, it, was, it dealt with welfare, but we also dealt with things as distant as resistant to illnesses and how donkeys were used in culture, in music. So it was like a really good initiative because it started covering a field which has been unexplored yet. Then the Donkey Welfare Symposium came here and it started focusing on the clinical aspects and the welfare aspects that were needed to be applied given the bad treatment that we were providing donkeys. So, you know, it really fitted an area which wasn't being explored. And the good thing that they were able to reach the scale that they have reached today with this symposium in the United States, that we have the biggest conference on a certain species. Try to ask somebody whether they would be aware that there's a conference dealing with donkeys it themselves, and they would not be aware. Because this is so unthinkable, given the lack of attention that we were paying to these animals. We as a species, we as humans. We as humans, yeah, we didn't know. I mean, we didn't know that donkeys were use, useful. So how would we expect that you're gonna have 250 people coming to a place to speak about them? So welfare, this is the ex explanation as to why they call it the donkey welfare, donkey because that, yes, that's the focus. Yeah. So then the then third one. Then we have the third one, which is in China. New niches ap appear for donkeys. I mean, it comes, we improve their welfare, we can think of other things. Then appears a conference in China. And China is about production. It has many more, I mean, it has many experts, uh, coming from around the world, speaking about 
welfare as well, because production is related to welfare. You know, animal production involves many things, involves uh, production, welfare, uh, clinics, uh, feeding, nutrition, uh, behavior, all the things are comprised by animal production. But still, we have the, the issue is that we do not know how to approach new productive niches. That is milk, meat, and skin. Work, it's not a problem. Why isn't it a problem? Because donkeys have been always been used for work and they're still being used. It's not a foreign thing. So it's not a foreign thing. And, think, and when people think of donkeys, they are pretty aware that they are used for that. But the problem is that we are pretty like naive people when it comes to production. When maybe if we extrapolate the cases of donkeys to other species, maybe a way to ensure that these animals are going to be preserved. It happened with skin. You may be more, more like, like uh, you, you may be for or against uh, the production of, of these kind of products. But still, if it involves the production of animals, it involves the preservation of these animals for this production. And what is best, it's through the improvement of their quality of life. The problem is that donkeys are complicated. Donkeys is like the, psychologically, is like, I would say, the most complicated species that I've ever worked with. Really? Yeah. So we need to provide them with their needs. As long as we have protocols to ensure that cows are having a good time while they are being milked, and I say a good time because, you know, we are humans. And animals are animals. We mustn't mix things. There's a huge number of people that need to be fed and fed every day. So we need to have that in mind. And the good thing is that, um, you know, you can have a scientific uh, reason for that, a religious uh, reason for that, but either way or the other, something provides us with this opportunity to have the diversity that we have had. You know, lifespan has increased. Sometimes it is a problem, but I mean, life has increased. We have new problems related to the, this lifespan. We are growing and growing, and the needs need to be satisfied. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I very much have an American background, and so part of me has an immediate emotional abhorrence to something like using a donkey for skin. But I also have to have to allow my intellect to take over and say there are certain countries that would say it's silly to have a pig in the house. Yeah. And yet we do that. I have my chickens at home and they sit on my lap and when they're gone, they, they get a nice little burial in the backyard. We have very specific reactions to the use of animals based on our culture and upbringing. And yeah. it's not necessarily realistic to the rest of the world. And the reality is of their economic sphere or their uh, climate or their culture. Yeah, actually it does. I mean, we need to be respectful. I mean, I'm respectful with people who doesn't want to eat me because I mean, it's their choice. Still, for me, it's not a valid argument to say that ones are living beings and the others not, because plants are also living beings. Yogurt, so, you're killing a couple million cells yeah, right there, are. aren't you? So yeah. we need to be respectful for everything that we do. And culture is something that we need to be respectful. And also, you need, we need to have a wide scope, because we do not know. I mean, we need to wear other people's shoes and to see what's the situation of people. Sometimes, uh, for me, I, would, I wouldn't use anything related to donkey skin, but it's my personal choice. So now, you talk about culture. Could you discuss for a minute, especially since you have such a huge background in the history of breeds, specifically the donkey, but you've done a lot of research. Um, could you explain how there's an association between our cultural heritage and our agriculture her cultural heritage? So, I mean, agriculture has been a part of society, human society, since the very beginning in the Neolithic. So, we cannot 
uh, separate things. It's just a company as well as a, a, a you know, interpersonal relationship. We have the way that we were able to provide ourselves and our families with the needs that we, that we have. So it, here it comes uh, plant growing and animal husbandry. So the practical things that we use to deal with the breed populations in certain areas are adapted to the needs of the animal and to the, to the needs of the certain area. So, of course, if you go to America, the needs are different than if you go to Africa. Also, the resources available are different. Your methods may not be valid for the place where I live, just because I don't have the resources. So what do we do? We cross our, our, our arms and we do nothing? No, we need to live. There's a lot of people that need to deal with the resources. And still, as we build these kind of practices, we are growing in knowledge. And what is culture? But a collection of knowledge. It's about, you know, these things are transferred, has been transferred from, from uh, one generation to another. And they differ because the needs are not different. Uh, I mean, the needs are different. Um, the world evolves, but it evolves towards different circumstances. So we need to be constantly adapting. And this can only be done through the cultural background that we have. So the identification portion, our, our, our animals are a part of what make us different in yeah. terms of different culture. Yes, our animals are part of our, of our background. I mean, why do we protect castles and buildings and we do not protect animals? They are our cultural background as well. You know, uh, remember of, the, of, of what happened with Notre Dame. It got burned and at the very few minutes before, uh, after, you have uh, very wealthy people paying to recover it. And I say it's totally, I mean, I'm not going to tell anybody what, what they have to do with their money. But you have the Amazonia. It got burned. How many people paid for the diversity that was being lost and was culture? With Notre Dame, you can recover. It may not be the same, but you can recover. But biology doesn't work that way. So the thing that we lost, the culture that is lost through the loss of animals, is lost forever. And if we, do not, if we don't do something to preserve them, I mean, we're going to get in trouble. But it's because we are losing much many things. I mean, when you lose a horse breed, you are not losing only a few animals that are related and that look like each other and that did similar things, but a whole genetic diversity that is lost. And, you know, as you wouldn't use um, a hammer to screw, uh, you know, to, 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 uh, to for, for a, a different purpose that a hammer is meant to, to be used, you are losing a tool that would be the perf that may be the perfect tool for a certain situation. And this no, there's no way back. I mean, you lose it and you lose it. So people need to be aware of that. If you liked our podcast, please subscribe. This is how we keep going. And please tell your friends to join us. Please feel free to post any questions or comments that you might have to our social media sites. Our Twitter feed is at Backyard Green Films, spelled B-K-Y-R-D-G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S. Our Instagram is at Backyard Green Films, B-A-C-K-Y-A-R-D-G-R-E-E-N-F-I-L-M-S. Our Facebook is Backyard Green Films. Our YouTube URL is youtube.com Backyard Green Films. We'd like to thank Dr. Javier Gonzalez for speaking with us today. For more information about the Donkey Welfare Symposium, please visit donkeywelfaresymposium.homestead.com. 
And for Dr. Gonzalez, please visit researchgate.net and type in his name. You have been listening to Agriculture with your host, Alara Bowman. Please tune in for more upcoming episodes from our travels. I'm Rick Bowman, your behind-the-scenes editor. Until next time. This has been a presentation of Backyard Green Films Productions, all rights reserved, copyright 2019.